questions like, who are you, what do you do, and how'd you get here? I'm Ryan Kenny. Um, what I do, I'm a husband, uh, a father of two girls, three and four, and I pastor a church, uh, Midtown Vineyard, um, that we're sitting in now. And uh, we're considered a church plant. So we started four years ago, just a little over four years ago now. Um, and how I got here, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, throughout my life, uh, athletics uh, was a big thing. Um, okay. And that continued for, yeah, a long time. And then I went into business for a number of years. Mm. Uh, and then at some point, uh, I kind of fell backwards into church ministry. And then this idea of church planning came up uh, along the way. And now I find myself leading a church plant as the lead pastor. Wow. Um, wow. Never, I didn't, I never wrote this on like my sixth grade. What do you what hope to be doing, yeah, you know, yeah. in the future or anything yeah. like that. Um, but it's, it's, it's a blast. Yeah. What good. did you play in a, uh... So did you, were you in athletics your whole life? Yeah. So, uh, w at whatever young age started playing soccer. Um, oh, so soccer. Yeah. So soccer is my primary sport dabbled with a few others, uh, along the way. And then, yeah, actually did. Yeah. Then went on, played in college and a little bit afterwards for a couple of years professionally. Did you have any dreams of like going pro or anything? <sighs> yeah. I mean, it, yeah. From the very beginning, like, I mean, I don't know. It probably all crosses our mind at some point. Yeah. yeah like, I remember being, learning uh, in, uh, I think it was seventh grade or eighth grade. I, this is a weird stat. Like I can remember like we had like a, I think he was like a professional, ex-professional football player came in and he talked about like the 1% type thing, like like 1% of college athletes go pro or something like that. Um, so it, I don't know, that, that one always stuck out with me, but I did, so I ended up playing freshly two years after that. So uh, I was in um, Salt Lake City for one year and then Rochester, New York. For oh, another, so you actually, and then back home. Yeah. Nice. And then from Fresno, Clovis, grew up in Clovis, um, and then ended up back here after being gone. I was gone in UC, at UC Santa Barbara, Sacramento State, and then a couple years afterwards. And, you know, the, the I'll never move back to Fresno kind of a thing. And oh, really? Uh, here uh, I am now. Okay, <laughs> who's, who's, your, uh, who's, who's your team? Who's your, your uh, soccer team? So uh, we have a, a group of us. We're split between Liverpool and Arsenal. Uh, and so I, I'm Arsenal uh, would be my oh, okay. European team. Yeah. Um, and then locally, I, I mean, in the MLS and things, I don't have necessarily a favorite team. Messi, I, I Miami. I love watching <laughs> Miami right now. I mean, it's entertaining. Suarez is there now. Like, yeah. it's a blast to watch. LAFC would be the, the MLS chosen team. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at a point now where there's not really many. There's uh, the goalkeeper for um, Kansas City, Sporting KC. Uh, I was with him for a year. So he's like one of like the, the few people left that I actually like was playing at that time with. Mm -hmm. So I, I watch less just around the league. Um, Messi's a blast. LAFC is my team. And okay. yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, I grew up playing like FIFA and stuff. So yep. like, that's what introduced me to soccer. Really, I didn't grow up. I played football like high school and stuff, but I wasn't like we moved so much. It was kind of like I, I gave it up after a while. So, like just sports in general. Yeah, really. Because we moved like my freshman year, moved like four times in one year. Just trying to jump on a and new so, team and yeah. do tryouts again. And then also skating. Like when I got here, I was skating with David so okay. much that like I kept hurting myself. Yeah. And so by the time spring, summertime, running around, coach was like. There you you got to go. stop skateboarding or you're going to go like full fledged skate. And I was like, I'm not quitting skating. So yeah, you're like, like no, I'm done with football. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. skated for, for a little bit. I, I had yeah. a couple of buddies that were good. I wasn't. Yeah. And so I, I would go with them. I could do a few things, kick flip, board slide. I think I got up to about five steps, mm -hmm. um, like some little things, but some of the guys that I was around were it's just really incredible. And, and they had this like a like, fearlessness to them also yeah. that it, it, I'm sure plays. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, that was one of the things that taught me how to kind of like, uh, I don't know, embrace the fact that, you know, you're going to expect some pain trying to do some sport or something. Right. I was I was kind of a, a little like a soft kid, you know, like I would like cry if I scraped my elbow, like and I'd complain and stuff. But then when I found skating in middle school, I think I started to kind of be like, no, I need to like grow up a bit. I got to take yeah, some pain and, and it really helped me. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I wasn't into sports. I wasn't, um, 
I think I tried out for like volleyball in elementary school. Okay. Yeah. Made like C team or something, you know, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. not not knocking on the C team, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But it, I think sports like physical stuff wasn't my like forte. But when I found skating, I think it was more creative and yeah. got me into, uh, you know, the design and stuff that I do now. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, man. So you said you're at Santa Barbara for. How many years? Yeah, I was there for a year. So my first year oh, okay. was at UCSB, and then I transferred up to Sacramento State. Um, so all all that that was that ended up being five years outside mm-hmm. of Fresno in California. Um, and then you said you did business uh, for yeah. So then, so I always had this idea that when I was done with athletics, however long that went, mm-hmm. um, I would go into medical device sales. So mm. we had like a family friend who was in medical device sales. I went on a ride along. Um, I think I was home from like my first year in college or something like that. So I was starting to explore it a bit. That was my ambition. When I when I was done playing, we we were back here. Caitlin and I had just gotten married. Uh, I was unsurprisingly done playing. So then it was kind of like, all right, well, we're in we, Fresno, yeah, yeah. and I guess. I guess I'm going to find a job. Um, yeah. And we were like, we were actually, we were planning on leaving again for another contract and all these different things. So we ended up here and every um, medical device company that I would interview with, they kept saying, you don't have any business to business sales experience. So they, they actually oh, want to see you go and build, you know, a, a bit of a um, resume. And so yeah. I ended up at uh, ADP, which they're like a large payroll yeah. and HR company. Mm-hmm. Um and here in the Fresno office, uh, small business sales rep, and did that for a couple years, found success, managed the sales team for a year. Um, and then and around that time is when my wife and I, we ended up at a new church and that church, the pastor was um, planting a new church. So actually this is where I learned about church planting mm-hmm. and starting new churches. And so we just jumped on that team. We loved the the people that we were leading with and, uh, and the lead pastor. And so it kind of jumped into it. So that was happening simultaneously with like my business career at that point. Gotcha. Um, got to a point where I was just like, I don't want to manage this office anymore. Uh, I have some aspirations to have my own business kind of a thing. So I actually partnered with a guy in town doing financial services to help strengthen his health insurance side of the business mm-hmm. for businesses. Nice. Um, Cause I had started to build that in uh, at ADP actually, I was a health insurance rep also. And then as that happened, church ministry kind of just kept happening at the same time more and more. And then after about a year of doing the business partnership, I was like, I think I want to do more church ministry. I'm going to split my Mm. time like half time. Oh, so you're doing them at the same time. It's happening at the same time. And it was at a very unofficial capacity with the church for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then it just started to just grab my attention more and more. When I was at work, I was thinking about church. Mm. And when I was at church, I wasn't thinking about work. (laughs) So it was all church. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Were you raised um, like going to church? Yeah, I always say I grew up in and around the church. Um, so I, I grew up at a, a church here called the University Vineyard and uh, involved. My parents were involved. My mom's been a, a worship leader for a long time. My dad was in leadership and uh, would teach and on the elder team and just certain things like that along the way. Um, had friends within the church and, but I mean, sports and outside friends in school were, uh, really what I gave most of my time to. So I, I eventually that started to take me more and more uh, traveling on the weekends for soccer, especially mm-hmm. in high school. Um, I just was not around as much. I was baptized when I was 12. Cool story there. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, in and around, but I, I, I always say like, oh, I think I like, I gave my life to Christ when I was 12, but I don't know if I ever actually like took it seriously or like yeah. did anything uh, to, to like reflect that change. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and went on and partied in college and I mean, so many other things along the way. So high familiar, familiarity of church, participated a decent amount, but was always kind of one foot in, one foot out. Yeah. 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 Um, sorry. I apologize for the, like the flickering of the light. Oh, we're doing that for a while. So yeah. there's um, something with like the power. I don't know if it's we'll, coming from like the, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cut that part out, but, um, just wanted to mention that. So let's back up a bit. So you are going, or you were raised in the church, mm-hmm. right? And then you go on to, uh, go to college and then you, get your, uh, you're doing your, your business at AD, ADP mm-hmm. and then you're also balancing, uh, practicing in the, in the church or, or like working with the church. Yeah. And then you decided to go, uh, 
like kind of like half half uh, business and then mm-hmm. half and then in the church, correct? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, and it was uh, so like uh, this would have been yeah one year into the business partnership, the church that we were a part of and, and now actually helping lead at that time. Um, which I started becoming a little bit more of official capacity. The door opened because we were actually uh, invited by a congregation down in Visalia, whose lead pastor was stepping away and wanted to have someone else come in and lead. So essentially, we're this small little church up here in Clovis, and we get invited to lead this about five, six hundred person church that's decently just struggling and having a number of challenges and, and unhealthy in some ways, but mm-hmm. still just a lot of life there and something worth like into. So with that offered, uh, at some point we kind of step in, we kind of start co-leading some things. And then, uh, the bookkeeper is, uh, moving on at that point. And so it was like for 500 bucks a month, I could become the executive pastor oh, <laughs> and, snap. and like spend time doing that. Yeah, yeah. So like there, there's no, like everything was just like a, a cut in life to like go more into ministry, but it was my joy. Like, so like right. as things, cause, cause business is going well, there's actually like a salary there and health mm-hmm. benefits and those kind of things. Yeah. And so it was like, or you could start becoming an executive pastor for $500 a month, but you have kids at the point uh, at that point my oh, wife was in nursing school we could just kind of do stuff like that that yeah, you know, yeah. just don't have the same implications now um and take on certain risks that we would just think through differently um and yeah so it kind of just again happened in like a backwards way and then there was a number of we merged with another church there was a lot of great things that happened um over like the next two years to where then it, it i ended up becoming a full-time pastor and yeah some I of the, see. yeah so um our brand paradigm our motto is now equals tomorrow so we've okay. adopted the idea that you know the work you put in now equals who you'll be tomorrow mm-hmm. and a lot of the books that we've read and discussed you know the concepts on online uh we've uh basically come to a realization or we've learned that there's a lot of principles or certain values that uh you can develop over time or kind of shift your lens into becoming you know the person that you want to be or the best version of yourself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that's our our logo it's like a it's an eye with like a lens on it oh yeah yeah yeah. and the first the first book that we read was seven habits of highly effective people Mm -hmm. Have, have you read that book is that one uh lencioni S- no, Kobe. Kobe. Yeah, Kobe. Stephen there Kobe. you go. Okay. Kobe. Kobe. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you read that book? I don't know if I've actually ever read it. Uh, mm. Been more aware of it for a while. That's a lot of people are aware of it. Yeah. Just because yeah. the title of it. We, yeah. Um, that book uh, kind of inspired our logo too, because okay. in, in the I think the first part of the book he talks about the Maps. the um, the lens in which we see the world, mm. right, and then how it can change. Yeah. And if we change that lens, then we can start to look at the world differently yep. and um tying that back into like when you were starting to realize that you wanted to be more active in the church mm-hmm. was there a shift in in your lens at the time or was there any like character traits that you had to develop in order to mm. take that on or was it like subconsciously or was there a choice to uh kind of like break away from something yeah no, that's a good question um yeah i think a number of things like when I think about getting into business originally, a part of it was that so I could be successful and have a lot of money and have this great career and do all the things I want to do. Um, stepping into ministry was like the opposite of that. It, it was yeah. actually like, oh, I'm going to go make like almost zero money mm-hmm. uh, and do things that oftentimes are for hopefully the benefit of other people that um, – is less about me and actually asks, you know, more sacrifice in certain ways. Right. So I think there's a couple things in that one is my actually lens, like the lens of generosity, um, being a way in which, uh, it can just be applied to like our entire life to like, to see that, uh, Jesus actually is quoted saying it's better to give than to receive. And if we actually take on that idea and we try it out, like, I don't know if I've ever regretted moments where I've been more generous with my life. Usually the moments I regret in my life are the ones where I was not generous. Mm. Um, And not just about writing a check or giving financially, but literally generosity with my entire life. Seeing everything that I do can be for the sake of someone else. Everything that I have could actually be for other people. Me giving it away rather than trying to get more can be a benefit, I think, not only just to me, but to others. 
And so that was, I, I think, something that I don't know if I was ever conscious of, but that's definitely what was being asked of me in, right. in some of that. Uh, I, I think I've grown to actually now start to see that as something to develop uh, when we think about habits and the things that we do over again that make us the person that we're going to be. Like generosity is actually something to practice. Yeah, um, right. uh, a very popular one right now is gratitude, right? Doing yeah. your, your gratitude journaling and saying the three right. things. That goes all the way back to the book of Proverbs. Like gratitude has been uh, like a long or around for a very long mm. time um, because it actually like it changes us. It rewires yeah. our brains. Like, and so these habits that we have in place, one of them was, can I continue to actually not only passively be asked to be a generous person, can I actually do things that's me now saying I'm going to continue to grow as a generous person, yeah. which is super hard because everything else in our life is telling you to yeah. not be generous and that yeah. you need more and you don't have enough. Self, self, self. You yeah. just got to keep going, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then where's it end? So that was one. So generosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was big um, that, hey, I could go make a ton of money and I could still actually not have effective change and live in a meaning and purpose. And, right. and like, what's yeah. why? What? Why? Why? What does that actually end up doing? <laughs> or I could like do something anyway. So generosity is one. Um, and then I think along the way. One thing that's definitely changed from my initial view of ministry to probably now and again, it will change five years from now and 10 um, is this idea that, I mean, again, I come out of sports and I come out of business. And so much of sports and business, one, your value is predicated on what you can produce, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you can't produce, you end up on the B or the C team, right? Like <laughs> very quickly, I think I was on the C Shout team. Shout out C team. I yeah. was on the C team in basketball in like the fourth grade. So like, I'm aware. I got, yeah, I was on the B team in baseball in fifth and sixth grade. All my friends in sixth grade are like automatically on the A team, but I'm on the right. B team as a sixth grader. <laughs> um, but like so much of my life again is what can I produce? Um, and so moving into church ministry, having this idea that my value is on what I can produce, what, what can I create? How can I do more for other people? Yeah. And so growing in, and again, I think this takes very, a lot of discipline and certain practices, um, in kind of the therapeutic world, there's uh, over-functioning and under-functioning are some ways of how we tend to operate. Um, I oftentimes over-function uh, even into other people's lives. I mm. think I have the right answer. And I have, this is what you should uh. do. And I can see this clearly. Why can't you? Um, and yeah. over time, uh, like breaking down this idea that a pastor needs to have all the answers and needs to tell people what to do and people need and moving more alongside of how do I come alongside other people in their life to encourage, to support, to listen, to ask questions so that they can continue to grow in their life with God and with others. Mm -hmm. What you don't need is me telling you what to do. That's just not helpful. We don't, we don't like people that tell us yeah. what to do. Yeah. Now, of course, there's consultants or mentorship, or sometimes you're like, hey, what would you do here? I would love to hear. And those are very helpful moments. Right. For the most part, though, what's better is that you and I arrive at the decisions that we're going to make by ourselves. Hmm. But oftentimes that actually is helpful to have someone like in the on the journey with you, asking you questions to help arrive at those moments. For sure. Um, so I, I think that was something that's been shaping and, and changing over time that I became intentionally, intentionally aware of uh, through some certain work that we've done um, that's been really helpful. And, and so, yeah, it's just changed a lot for me. The things I can't produce every thing. I'm not worth what I can do for others. Um, and that I can actually just sit with people in their lives and come alongside as a friend and an encouragement. And of course, hopefully have moments of wisdom and helpfulness, but I don't have to have For all the sure. answers. You said, you said over function and what was the other one? Over functioning and under functioning. Oh, okay. Over um, and under. And, and there's, and there's some other ones in and around that. And I'm by no means, am I a licensed therapist or know all the things <laughs> of the, the, uh, psychology, but, um, out of our own anxiety, oftentimes we can move towards one of those, mm -hmm. uh, over functioning is a way of actually me taking on more responsibility for something or of something or for someone that I don't need to. Underfunctioning is me not taking on responsibility and actually allowing others to take on more than they need to or do more than they need to. Um, 
And we see that in our lives. I mean, and I think relationships are a balance and working back and forth. I was just going to say that, yeah. It's almost like a fine balance. 100%. Yeah. Like, because, I, I mean, I, when Caitlin and I got married, uh, our marriage was defined by I get to overfunction and she gets to underfunction, meaning I get to pretty much determine what we do with our lives and what things look like. And she loved the idea that I can go and create and do and, and she can just kind of live in my shadow in a way. And that, I think that was an unhealthy way in which we started of mm -hmm. not noticing those things. But again, I, the, whether we know those things at that, that moment or not, I, I think it matters less than how we continue to go through it over time. Recently, we're married 12 years now in our 10th year, we started to realize just different challenges of communication and mm -hmm. uh, our uh, just being for one another and being on a team. And we have, you know, we're raising two girls and all these different stresses. Um, we noticed that over time, Caitlin wanted to also have say in what we do. And I actually shouldn't be the one trying to determine everything and figure it out and make all the decisions. And so it's taken actually like intentional work of starting to redesign how we operate in our marriage together to where we're more aware of the moments and the places in which we tend to over and under function so that we can function together better. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I can, I don't have to take on more responsibility and she doesn't push away responsibility. And so yeah. I know how to invite her into things differently and she has a different voice and a say and and vice versa. Um, yeah. And we could, you know, a bunch of other examples that are probably helpful for 100%. that, but there's yeah. some stuff in there. Well, I want to I wanna ask specifically on the communication part, like mm -hmm. what are some identifying, like not specifically, maybe you've heard yeah. other like relationships that you're like, oh, I've actually went through that and I've seen that in my relationship and that's probably like playing a role into getting closer and to allowing, let's say, the relationship of like a man or a woman, one of the parties being more, let's say, controlling or more mm -hmm. operational over the other person. So they kind of follow in the shadow. What do you think is the best method or like at least according to like your experience or like what you've seen work best in your relationship yeah. to get to that like fine understanding or that fine balance of like where like it's more equal and it's not you're not living in the shower, shadow of me or I'm not li living in the shadow of you, but our communication is effective and we're getting to where we want to get. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Based on like, is it communication? Is it something else? Is it like mm -hmm. things that have been brought up in the past from like mm -hmm. the relationship? So, cause we, we always have this conversation like me, him and, um, Jay and John, like what is an effective way to kind of get that balance between a relationship? Like yeah. not taking on so much and being the, yeah the person that operates the shadow and the person just totally. follows the shadow. Yeah. So, uh, like really like, what do you think is shown you like an effective method? Like, yeah. is it just communication? Yeah, that's good. Um, and by no means do I have all the answers here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, like you said, everything's different. And yeah, so, so I think in our, I'll start with our own, my own experience and my own marriage and then even thinking through other relationships. Um, Man, having places to like reset every once in a while and like go back to some form of, of a basics of staying on the same team mm -hmm. um, are huge. And we're not great at this. I, I think that um, did you guys that do any Enneagram work. Familiar yeah, Enneagram. yeah. <laughs> Jay, yeah. Our, our other member, he, I was with, I wish he was here. He's actually reading a book about Enneagram. Okay. And What's so he's almost, uh, I wouldn't be able to off the top of my head. There's um, a, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's, there's a few, like, I can maybe text him after the interview uh, and see, man, see yeah, if I you've heard remember. of it, yeah. but he's like, he's almost to the end yeah. and he, he brings up every Sunday. Like, dude, yeah. it's good stuff. And it, here's the thing, just like any personality test, it's good to name that we are not our type. Hmm. So like I, I would I would type as an Enneagram three, which would be like short one word phrase is the achiever. That's that's um, mine too. Is I, it? The last time I took that one, that was mine. Yeah. yeah. So like what it's so helpful in is I'm not a three. I'm typed as a three. But if we think about and, and again, this goes into some, you know, life with Jesus thought is that like, we're, we're not our time. We're not boxed into it. But what it is, is it's a great tool to help become more aware of our natural tendencies, mm. the ways in which we operate when we're healthy, the ways in which we operate when we're under stress. Right. Because like, you can use that as kind of like a scapegoat for things. Too. Absolutely. You, you could be like, well, it's just the three in me or like. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just a, I'm just a Leo, you know. Yeah, I've like, heard that. Yeah, so much. I've heard. That's just how that. I am. Yeah, and Deal then everyone it. else in the room has to just be like, 
Well, I guess I'll just okay, have to put I'm, up with well, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's not helpful. Yeah. It's like, no, like, oh, you're an Enneagram A. You like to like push through and everyone's got to go your way. No, you're just being a real jerk right now. Uh -huh. Like, you know, like you can't just go off of those tendencies. For me, I can be shallow and superficial and I can mm. care too much about image. And uh, it, it, it could be a, a drive towards production and achievement. And then I can get frustrated because other people don't want to achieve as me. So Caitlin's an Enneagram 9, um, which she, um, which is the peacemaker. So in, in our house, some of the things that uh, when we get in an argument or a fight or whatever it is, I, I can I can be quick with my words. I can put thoughts together very quickly. I can, in my mind, I've arrived at the best decision for everybody. <laughs> Here's the answer. Um, and so when we're in it, I'm like, no, 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 come on, let's settle this now. What do you what do you mean by that? Yeah. And I will keep kind of pressing where as a peacemaker for her, she's like, get me away from any conflict as far as possible. Mm -hmm. And I need time and space to actually think what I'm feeling. I don't know what I'm feeling right now. Um, and I'm one, like, I know how I feel very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, now, would it be beneficial for me to also step away and really think through how I'm feeling and why am I feeling that way and what did irk me and why am I taking that personal? Yeah. Um, but even something like that, it's helpful for us to be aware of those things because then I can continue growing and giving her space. She can continue growing and actually saying something in the moment that's helpful mm -hmm. for me. Like, so rather yeah, than yeah. just pulling away and running, she can be like, Hey, here's what I feel like. I feel like pulling away and running right now. I don't have words yet. I, I can't tell you how I'm feeling. Can you just give me a little bit of space? And how much more helpful is that than just running and then me being frustrated with the running? And I can be, oh my gosh, of course. Yeah, take the space. Right. Now, I need to keep growing though to make sure that I give her space even when she can ask for that sometimes, right? So having these little ways of like resetting. Another one is, uh, for us has been this, when I come home from any type of a day, um, she's been with our girls most of the day. Uh, I'm with people and reading and writing and doing other things throughout the day. After a day when I get home, I don't want to have to like relive each step of my day. Cause I just did. There's an exhaustion there. At the same time, I got to remember that she's been with two little tiny humans that like aren't adults and that are exhausting. Yeah. And she had like zero, like, like much less adult engagement than I did. So I don't want to relive my whole day, but at the same time, I know that she wants connection <laughs> with adults and specifically me. So there's a balance even there. What type of questions are being asked at the dinner table? Hey, how was mm -hmm. your day is going to get a good from me. I'm just going to say good. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, but if she was say, um, you know, hey, here was the long day with the girls or here was the exciting point. Uh, what was something that, that made you happy today? Th that's just such a different conversation. And then right. me entering in with, hey, how are the girls today? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, cool. Can you tell me more about that moment? And it, like we can actually start talking mm. differently. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's another one. And then I, I think another one has been, and we're not great at this one because we – she can tend to, um, she loves, she thrives when there's structure, but to get to a place of creating any structure or, or having that, um, is hard for her. I love structure and, and appreciate it when it's designed, but the work it takes me to design structure is also a little bit challenging, but I can see it in my mind. So mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a gap there. Um, but when we have like a monthly check-in and we actually talk through like, here's our finances and how are the girls doing with school and where are you and I at? And Hey, when's our next, you know, two nights away each quarter. And like when we actually have a space to pause and do that and actually have like a paper that we work through, um, Night and day difference. Yeah. Night and yeah, day. Yeah. So having these little things that are resets or checkpoints or things that you can kind of hang on to and like habits kind of do over and over again. Um, but I think it takes a lot of work to get there because knowing personalities, I think doing marriage counseling or couples counseling or it's just huge. Well, yeah. it, involves, yeah. it involves the uh, the shifting of like the lens, you know, yeah. you know what you saw yourself or how you would react to a situation yep. um, on both both ends to produce some sort of. Uh, you know, more positive result versus just reacting based off of your, uh, your mm -hmm. typical tendencies. Yeah. Right. And it's like you start work. to respond, not just react. Very right. Different. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. Different. yeah. 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 I think the underlying premise that I would gain from like asking that question is like one, find a reset, find somewhere where like there can be an established reset mm -hmm. part of like the relationship to where mm -hmm. you can find a neutral ground. 
Two is either when you're off work, coming home, find a way to find a natural balance between conversation so the communication doesn't get like blown overboard or like you're so exhausted to where like you don't even want to communicate, but it's also affecting that person. Yeah. And three, it's just finding that way to almost reset. And it's like the underlying is like you need to be able to reset and have like that natural balance and not bring work or the things on the outside into your relationship yeah. and f always find that like neutral ground. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to have like a tool for that also. Yeah. 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 We, I think tools are important for us. We're not, we're both not the most like, Hey, here's how I'm feeling. Here's all like, we're not the greatest communicators in yeah. general. So to have a tool that helps us communicate mm -hmm. with each other, huge. Mm -hmm. Some people are naturally like that. Yeah. We're not. Yeah. What, what would be an example of like that a tool? So like even like the little like we do it, we have like a monthly check in sheet. We probably only use it once every three months. But like with that tool helps us talk through finances. What are our hopes and dreams? Mm. Uh, how are the girls doing? Do we need to like, mm. you know, does, do I need yeah. to spend more time with one of them than the other? How, like that kind of stuff. Some sort of system. Yeah. yeah yes. To just put it on paper and it's like less uh, from one side. It's like both parties are agreeing to like this is how we do something is a tool for both of us. Yeah. It also removes the, that, that memory too. You free up storage up here and yeah. you put it on paper to where like yeah. you have more free space oh. up here. We, well, yeah. To depersonal real quick, that last thing you just said to the depersonalization of it. So when we, when we look at our monthly finances, I'm a thought, I, I have thought to our finances constantly. Caitlin doesn't. Now, what tends to happen is then I could get frustrated because, you know, she's not paying attention to our finances throughout the month. She gets frustrated because I'm the one always asking about the finances. Mm. Like, yeah. so if we don't have a common place to say, hey, this piece of paper is asking us how we're doing with our finances. Now it's about the piece of paper asking, not us wow, asking each other. Yeah, yeah. So now we're just like, oh, yeah, no. How are we doing there? This is my thought. What's your thought? And we can actually, like, be on a team together with it in a different way rather than one of us operating mm. from a place of anxiety like around finances. Or I like that. So that the depersonalization is, yeah. is super helpful. Because I've, I've experienced that, and I'm pretty sure David's experienced that, where it's like, it's coming from you, so it feels like it's almost like an attack, or like yeah. it feels like yeah. you're not really like, you don't really care, you're just trying to pick at me. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 let's use this piece totally. of paper. Let's use yeah. this piece of paper. And you'd rather <laughs> share your view <laughs> yeah. rather than like listen to the other person's. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think. Yeah, because yeah, you got all the solutions. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, in your mind, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, that's good. So uh, I had a question. You know, we've been talking about character changes personally uh, or shifting the lens uh, within yourself to mm -hmm. sort of see how to respond better uh, to, you know, like in this example, we used your wife mm -hmm. um, when leading a church. Right. Because that's multiple. I mean, it's a it's a crowd. It's a group of mm -hmm. it's a community. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that is a little bit different in the sense that you're you're providing you know, some foundation for other, other people that, you know, people are needing, but they're also coming to learn from specifically, you know, like God's word mm -hmm. in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Um, has there been any character shifts on, on that scale versus like addressing one person, but now it's like a, it's a community that you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're effectively leading the, the church, you yeah. know, has, has there been any, um, changes there that you've had to adopt? I know you mentioned, uh, you know, generosity is one mm. of them. Has there been any, any mm. other ones? Yeah. Ho hopefully, hopefully I've changed a lot, um, <laughs> in, in, in good ways. And, and the reason why I ask is because, you know, uh, I know you personally, mm -hmm. we, I've been going to this church, uh, for anybody listening for maybe like six or seven months now. Um, uh, I had a friend, Trevor Ford, who invited me to church. So shout out Trevor. Um, Trevor's and, I, I felt, uh, you know, good about going to church. I, I felt like there was uh, a calling for me to go to church, uh, you know, months ago. And, you know, running into you as, as the leader for this church and like reaching out to me personally, uh, getting that that vibe that, you know, I, you know, I just want to see how you're doing. We can go get coffee and hang out. That was something that I think made me more connected to the church in that way. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why I want to know like, what, what, how does that feel? You know, like leading a, leading a church or what, what had to change in order to mm -hmm. uh, be that sort of like lighthouse to, to other people around mm -hmm. you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot. Um, and again, I think these are things that will uh, hopefully always be changing in regard to growing in, um, 
yeah, there's aspects in which me, some of the ideas coming into pastoral ministry again was that I needed to have answers. Mm -hmm. And that if I, if I don't have the answers, I can't lead. Um, and so therefore I'm a poor leader when I can't give the answers. And that's been a big shift for me to not see leadership as having the answers. Um, Edward Freeman uh, defines leadership, uh, paraphrased here a little bit, um, as being able to make decisions in anxious times. Hmm. So when when hard things are happening, when life is happening, when things are out of control, can the leader in the room still help make good decisions for the whole of the people? Um and do it in a non-anxious way that isn't being swayed by so many different variables. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we're always in, in being influenced by something. There's always a level of anxiety within us. Right. So can we continue to grow in ways that lessens the anxiety so that I can make non-anxious decisions and build non-anxious relationships mm. that aren't always also attached to me, but are actually being like connected with one another? Um, a part of it, I think, is like for the for the longest time, even preaching and teaching uh, f with the Bible on a Sunday morning is telling people what to think in our Western evangelical way of church um, or even maybe just a Western way at large is a shift from do people actually want to be told what to think or do they actually want to be invited to new ways of how to think? Mm. And can transformation actually come through the worldview, the ways in which I'm seeing the world, the questions that I'm asking, like rather than just walking away with a new piece of information that I take into the week, forget by Tuesday and keep going. Mm. And then I got to mm. come back for another piece of information. Um, now, that doesn't mean that information is is unnecessary. Information is a starting point, but information alone doesn't lead to transformation. It's information. It's practicing that information. It's reflecting on it. It's actually like a little bit of a life cycle. Um so shifting in some of that has, I have had to grow in, I think a lot of ways, like actually letting go of opinion from other people. Um, because if on my worst week, mm -hmm. I'm caring what other people think after a Sunday message sure. and I'm like, how'd that go? Did they like it? Like, you're just that's, like working through the things. That's the three in you. Dude, yeah. You create a graphic and you put it out there and yeah. you know, it's like, oh my gosh, what are other people yeah, going to think? Yeah. They're like, oh, frick, I could have spent another hour on it. And I could have done this better. And like, it's just always there. Yeah. And if on my good weeks, it's actually like, no, my role here is to maybe even pray more than write. But like, can I can I go ahead of where we're at this week? Can I actually experience the text? Let the text hit my own life first and foremost. Yeah. And then on a Sunday morning, I'm inviting the rest of us into what I've experienced, plus studying and talking with others and then thinking through, asking questions, trying to offer little experiences and guides for people to try on. So hopefully... They're having an experience, experience with God themselves, mm. not just hearing new information from me. Yeah. Um, and that's take a lot, taken a lot of different shifts in how I view myself as a leader, how I view other people and what they want. Because mm. oftentimes, how many times do you some, do something because you think that's what people want from you? 100%. Right? That's yeah. like a lot of our yeah. life. Yeah. But Definitely. if you actually ask the room, they're like, I don't need to know anything new. I just want to like like experience other people and like have like a non ideological yeah. space to like think about the life of Jesus and how that impacts me. Yeah. That's much different than giving answers. You know, it's a hundred percent different from, you know, coming down with like the, uh, the hammer of God that I think a lot of people think church is like, mm. you know, like you're, you're wrong. Mm. Um, Here's all the solutions. There you go. You know, right. like, yeah. <laughs> like, stop doing this, start doing that. So, yeah. 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 I, I was, I was a bad kid growing up and, like me, my mom always took us to church. Shout out to the bad kids. Yeah, no, nah, I was like kids. a bad child. And um, I definitely remember being like put in front of pastors, like trying to fix mistakes mm -hmm. and stuff. And um, but while I was before I got like to the age of like 12, like we would consistently go from like six to like 10. Mm -hmm. um, but I never understood the reason behind church. I never my mom never explained it to me. She mm -hmm. just was like, we need to go to church. We need to like do these things. We need to like stay consistently in the church. Totally. And so the older I got, like the people I was hanging out with, like I just kind of lost the the idea of what church ever meant. I never even found what the idea ever meant. Yeah. I just kind of like was pushed into it. My yeah. dad still follows the church heavily, but even to this day, um, I'm recognizing like I think I fell out of it because of that intimidation factor. Like mm. 
I'm wrong because I've done bad and everybody at the church is good because they're going to church or they like, they know something that I don't know. Yeah. And so as a kid, I like growing up, I was just like, I'm not doing that no more. Yeah. Like, cause I feel like I'm imperfect. I feel like I'm not enough for Absolutely. like God or like, and I never let God leave my life. It's more of just like, I operated in a sense of like, God doesn't have control of my life. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where like recognizing now that like, I don't actually have control of my life. Like, <laughs> that's good. Like, yeah. th- like, so it's, yeah. and I found a lot of this, like through my own, like just experience and having to find out on my own, but just reflecting and how David mentioned, like that fear of like knowing and not knowing mm-hmm. like intimidates yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And I so, think once you yeah, have that, that plant of, uh, the, like even like a super small amount of faith in something mm-hmm. that's beside your own, I guess, premeditated plan for what you think is like going to happen for you, Mm -hmm. you know, that leads to something else differently entirely. And it's an invitation. It's really not like a, like a, you know, I don't know anything other than God's plan. (laughs) Like, yeah, yeah. 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 Like see, like, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a conversation. I feel like it's more dialogue. It's more of a group thing. And even Mm -hmm. like, I think like last church service, we did like a group activity where we all practiced, Note taking, writing mm-hmm. about our suffering, right? Mm-hmm. That was a, mm-hmm. uh, that was pretty eye opening, and I still remember the the note that I got when we yeah. switched notes. You know, and it was just another, another perspective on on things. You know, a hundred percent, yeah, well, super and crazy. That's a part, right? Like, even that, as you mentioned that, I'm I'm even thinking through, yeah, what we do on Sundays and what we do in the rest. Like, hopefully, thinking through, like, well, what is church and why do we even do it? And if we think all the way back to the early church and we think about religion historically. Um, I mean, in so many ways, first and foremost, it's like a shared experience with other people. Mm -hmm. And when you actually hear about someone else's life or the things that are going, or when you share your own life and, and rather than feeling like, oh, I'm here to gain answers Mm -hmm. or I'm here to flaunt my perfection, which is impossible to do, but some people still try it for some reason in church. Um, it's actually a place where like there's shared experience and relationship in life to where you can know others and you can be known by others. And because that's essentially who God is like, he's, he's one and who he actually wants to be known by us and he wants us to know him. And yeah. you just keep kind of going, um, back and forth with that. And it's more so a shared experience. So how do we continue to facilitate shared experiences right. rather than just answers to the mysteries of the world and like you're saying, uh, one of you just mentioned like that idea that takes you on a journey. Like when you're asking questions, like so much of exploring faith, I think, is the mystery behind things that we will never, yeah. ever be able to ro- like land at this this finitude of everything. Yeah. And we can t- continue to explore. That's where transformation is. It's, like that journey. Along it's almost way. like a parallel between, you know, how we talked about having two parties uh, operating on their tendencies versus like responding to each other in mm-hmm. the same way the church can maybe react to something versus responding to each other yeah. and, and the, the message. That's good. You know? So yeah. that's pretty interesting there. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. The one thing I've kind of reflected on, um, a lot this past, like few weeks, um, is fall in love with like the journey mm-hmm. and not the destination. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you get caught up in the destination, then you lose sight of like my own, this is my own like belief is like you lose sight of like God, you start mm-hmm. to lose sight of like the whole process of how you're even going to get there. Mm-hmm. It's like, don't worry about that. Just enjoy everything you're doing now. Yeah. Just figure out how to like find more love in this. Yeah. Like yeah. you'll figure that out, but yeah. you don't know what's coming tomorrow. <laughs> like yeah. why worry about 10, five years, right? Like just Man. fall in love with whatever you're doing now. Yeah. Jesus uh, literally said, he's like, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough of its own. Yeah. Like there, there's enough happening right now right. in this moment that whatever I'm thinking about tomorrow, what's going to happen next week or five years from now, I, who's to say I'm going to be alive past today? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Who's to say I'm going to yeah. make it through today? Yeah. And I've been spending my time worrying about the thing that's going to happen next week that I don't have an answer on yet. You know, like it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, like it is, I think, healthy and helpful and even there's wisdom in it and we see it throughout the scripture. Like plans are, are still important. Uh, we're not asked yeah, to goal not setting make plans, and stuff. Yeah. right? Like how do we make plans and at the same time just go, all right, God, here's, here's my plans. Whether I created these, whether you created these with me, whether this was your idea, I don't know, but just help me. And then we just kind of start to walk things out as we go and be generous 
with the ways in which it changes Mm -hmm. because they're going to, (laughs) there's just no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, keep the conversation going, you know, now we're starting to talk about, you know, the, let's just say if there's someone listening right now, they maybe had grown up with some, uh, maybe not so great experiences with the church or Mm -hmm. what religion they were maybe, uh, prescribed to at a young age and they have their walls built up with Mm -hmm. the idea of, um, God in general or religion where, what are some things that maybe, uh, I know we've talked about invitation into the conversation, Mm -hmm. some, some other ways to sort of, uh, I don't know, maybe even to like other Christians out there, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to help, keep that conversation going or where's a, where's a reference point to start from? Um, because I, I mean, I know people that they do have those walls built up and they're, they're pretty hard to, mm-hmm. to just, I don't know how to say knock down because that's not like that. And I think that like creates a feeling of like Christians are going to come down and just knock the walls down and we're here to spread, you know, as uh, by force the message, but there maybe is a way to get that response, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's hard, man. I mean, it's, yeah, it's <laughs> like not easy for sure. Yeah. Cause it's in, in, in it, cause I, but it's a good question and it's worth like seriously considering. And then for people to be asking along the way for themselves, um, we joke that, uh, that bad Christians happen to good people. <laughs> and so like, when you think about like how much of, of our view of God and of faith is because of other people and how we see them act, whether they call themselves a Christian or a Buddhist or a Satanist or whatever, like whatever they're identifying as in regard to their faith or their religion or who their God is, we then start to understand their God by who they are. Mm. Now, what's crazy about that is that God in so many ways did design that. Like when we think about through like just Christianity in general, we would first and foremost say, no, our faith is based on the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So we, we can't, we can't trump that by any means. But then what happens next is that people actually understand God's love by the ways in which we love and the ways in which we serve and take care of the poor and the widowed and the orphan, the the ways in which we press into forgiveness and mercy and kindness and patience with each other. So actually the ways in which we experience God happens by the way you, we three operate together. Yeah. And then people look at that and be like, "Whoa, whoa, hold on. You, you forgave him. Why'd you, you, you can't forgive him. He doesn't deserve Mm, that. That's a big one. And it's like, huge one. Well, God forgave me and, I can't not forgive him because I'm forgiven. Right. So actually the ways in which people start to experience God is through the ways they see other people interact. So that's a hard one to reconcile because I'm like, God, that's a bad idea, man. <laughs> like we're going to mess it up. And I heard, uh, there's a guy, uh, he wrote something, um, bullies, uh, shoot, great book. But in it, he uses the example, like, um, uh, let's take Mozart, for example, like Mozart, can, you know, writes a piece and plays it musically, man, you could have another highly trained artist, not going to play it as well as Mozart. Hmm. And so there's this idea that like, like God has designed something and Jesus has lived it out so well we're going to play it poorly because we're not Jesus. Mm. And yet that doesn't change the beauty of what Mozart originally created. It doesn't mean that Mozart's original piece was crap. It doesn't mean that Jesus, you know, everything that he lived out and taught isn't worth going after. It's just, we're not the full image of what it actually is. And so how do we continue to hold Jesus at the center of things? Mm. So when we're talking about God, when we're talking about Christianity, when we're talking about religion, May we be talking about it and living it out through the lens of who Jesus is, who he said he was, what he did. Now, of course, the danger isn't at all is that, you know, three people can sit together and talk and we all have different worldviews and we have different interpretations and we have different ideas of what that means and what it looks like. And I think that's also a part of it, though. Like, can you actually get in a room and talk and listen and hear what other people think? And we're living in a, in a time where that's becoming incredibly hard. Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it feels it's, impossible. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's it's almost near impossible, and I think what, like you said, it was designed almost designed in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's it's 
it's weird because we're talking about lenses shifting, right? Mm -hmm. But in order for conversations to have, it's almost Mm -hmm. like you are attacking someone's lens if you are, you know, even bringing the conversation up. Um, And it involves shifting to understand each other in in some manner, I would say. So that's very interesting. It's like the... Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, and a part of it, like, like one of the things that we, uh, we do some, something called emotionally focused and, uh, it's a discipleship, it's a discipleship to Jesus. It, it also takes in these ideas that, um, I'm just a lot of therapeutic and, and, um, psychiatry, like where we have early experiences in our life that we've made a meaning from. And then we choose to away a script or a vow to live from that point, oftentimes for survival and self-protection. Hmm. Now, this can happen through positive experiences also. I'll give one example. But mostly they're like the hard negative examples, right? The We've trauma. been mistreated. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's authority in our lives that has abused us. There's things in which we've been left out of friend groups that was really hurtful, but we were yeah. 12. And So like there's things that happen... We make a meaning saying, because of this experience, it means this about other people or about me. So therefore, I'm never going to allow myself to be vulnerable again, because when I'm vulnerable, I'm hurt Mm. and I never want to feel that pain again. Mm. Or I'm never going to trust again, because when I trust people, they can never hold up to what they say they're going to do. Now I walk away hurt. So I'm just never going to trust anybody again. Yeah, that's it's scary to think. Like, I guess, like, when we grew up, right, we were probably in a def- different generation mm-hmm. from, like, how you grew up. But are like, you trying to say old? <laughs> not, not at all. But, but more of, like, we still, had, we still had the ability to be outside, like, as children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and yeah. Jay were just talking. Jay's uh, the other podcast member, um, and so is John. But me and Jay were on a bike ride yesterday, and we were talking about this um, podcast that we're listening to about cell phones and technology in mm-hmm. children's life, especially, like, teenagers right yeah. now. And we probably we all probably had cell phones throughout school but it wasn't the level it's at now right. where everything like is play snake literally and yeah. so you still have to have recess you still have to go do this you still yeah. have to go talk to people now it's like you don't even need to go outside yeah. as a child anymore and the conversation led to thinking about like how you just mentioned um like the wall, like how difficult it is to have conversations Mm -hmm. nowadays. Like, I'm not sure if it's through because of cell phones or people are just so divided in general, but the thought process that me and Jay were having was like, like, let's just think that this gets worse and worse and worse. And we're already recognizing emotional intelligence, communication, the whereabouts of us as humans needing to sit down and talk about things yeah. has gone so it's out mm-hmm. the window at this point. It's not even in the house anymore. Like it's, it's, it's oh. running away. How are we going to get back to that yeah. point? Like yeah. of communication, if no one wants, yeah. like if trauma, let's say someone is like, yeah. they have that, they use that as like, I'm never letting that wall down again. Yeah. And then yeah. you have the access to this. Totally. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like you solidified it. Like, well, it's, it's your curated echo chamber. Yeah. Right? Like, you go on that thing. The algorithm plays to just give you the things that are going to give you the dopamine hits, which means you need people to agree with you or the click stuff that gets you fired up to, like, sink more into yeah. the point. So with that, like, we talk about the worldviews, the places. And, and, and in this emotionally focused work, there's a recognition that says... Uh, there, there's a piece Cazero does a stuff around uh, emotionally healthy spirituality. He says, Jesus might be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones. Hmm. So like there's things that have formed you, whether genetically, whether just the ways you grew up, the influences you had, the friends you had, the experiences that you had, mm-hmm. that those things are still in you and a part of your life. So when, um, you know, people are sunken into a way of seeing the world, well, it's because they've sat under that view or been influenced that way for so long. Who's to say they're just going to change all of a sudden? And yeah. this is a part of why you see, I think, the, the, the massive influence of political allegiance, even within the Christian church. And now you have everything is a, like through a political Glenn. lens in which you view the church. It's, it's, I mean, it's wild. But a part of it we're saying discipleship to Jesus is actually how your worldview starts to expand and change and grow so that you can become a more loving, whole, kind, grace-filled, merciful, forgiving, gentle person. Mm. And it takes, though, the work to say, I don't have all of the information here. 
I have this one tiny bite of information in regard to the lifespan of humanity and all the people around yeah. me, man, I might actually learn something about God by hearing both of your experiences and the way in which you view things. Yeah. Hey, tell me why you vote that way. That's so interesting. I tend to vote this way. It's not that you're this and I'm that. It's well, you've arrived there for some reason. Could I actually take like interest and curiosity in your life? And may I grow and learn more that way? But again, I think you actually have to have like a higher view of something and something larger influencing you to say oh, there's more to the story yeah, than yeah. just myself. That makes sense. And so in the emotionally focused work, it is a lot of recognizing the experience that we've had, how we've gotten to this point, because we just take our worldview into Christianity. Now we're reading the scriptures and we're looking at the life of Jesus through where we've already arrived. And just like everything else in our life, we're looking for those scriptures to agree with everything that we've already arrived mm. at. And yeah. you can do that. There's no question. You can look through the scriptures and you can manipulate anything to fit, to fit. you. Holy shit. No, and then people don't change. And like, shit. they're still complete jerks 20 years later, though they've been going to church every Sunday. Because they actually haven't opened themselves up to the hard work of asking people, hey, how, yeah. what do you think about me, man? I think we've had that conversation so many times on our podcast. It's wild. Like, and I think that's a big reason why we started it, too, is yep. to get away from like our own ideolo ideological way of thinking yep. about life. It's like we're trying to open our lens yep. and see, okay, we started this. We started with Book Club. How do we diversify into something else yep. to Dude. expand that wa that eye view, the lens in, of what we need? In the, uh, yeah. in, in the story of uh, Jesus, he, he kind of flipped almost everything on people's heads when uh, they thought they had it all like mm -hmm. figured out, too, which is crazy because he was the only one that was like, like he, 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 the way he spoke was that, I mean, it, 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 it was the opposite of, or what maybe they weren't prepared, like the Pharisees prepared for what he was going to say mm -hmm. so much that they were like, they, you know, he was crucified yeah. because of what he was doing. Yeah, they had all the answers. And then when Jesus was standing right in front of them, they couldn't even see him. But they they knew about Jesus more than anybody. They had all the answers. Dude, Conrad Gimpf, uh, he writes a book called Jesus Asked. This is so fascinating and I think overlooked so much. Uh, it's, it's helped me in a lot of ways. Um, and he talks about in the book of Mark and throughout the Gospels in general, the four books that talk about Jesus' life, um, that there's like 50-something conversations with people. And there are conversations in which someone has asked Jesus a question. And some of them can, you know, people ask two questions in it. So actually there's like, you know, 52 conversations, but 56 questions are asked, something like that. And he goes, how many times did Jesus answer their question? And it's like three times. Because he always asks a question back to the question that they asked mm -hmm. him. And so he goes on to say, like, Jesus was continuing trying to invite people to expand the way in which they were thinking, not give an answer. I mean, people come to him all the time and ask a question. He doesn't say, oh, here's the right answer and walk away. He asks them a question. He draws them in. He says, well, hold on, let me ask you this. You see it this way. This is what you're going after. Let me ask you this, though, because there might be something bigger. Here. Or some sort of parable or like a... Yeah. Yeah, something yeah, to think about. Totally. Yeah. The parables get you to ask questions and view things differently outside of yourself. And so he's not running around giving all these simple answers to things, yet we think that's oftentimes the thing we need. We need the simple answers because we it's hard to embrace mystery. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I mean? the, the, the way in which he, he lived was sort of... I mean, is the answer, you know, mm -hmm. for, for the Christians out there. Mm -hmm. Like the... The, his his t like yeah. timeline yeah. actions and even the way like he he lived was yeah. and and for yeah. most people it's well who's god and jesus would say well you've seen me so you've seen god you've seen the way in which i act that's that's who god is you've seen the way in which i've forgiven extend mercy you've seen the way in which i've divide you know actually broken down some of the barriers to to religion to worship uh he goes on and on and I, he's saying like the way in which i'm living you've now seen God. Here's your answer. Hmm. Look at the way I live. It's wild. Yeah. I can say for myself too, you know, as I've grown spiritually, um, you know, going to church more, listening to God in my life, it is really easy to fall into that, like disagrees or aligns with what I wanted to say mm. to be able to have this trump card on the people. And it's, a. Uh, it's something to to really reflect on. Um, so I'm glad that we're having this conversation because it helps me too, you know, and I, I'm, I hope that it helps people out there that are maybe trying to navigate those conversations better and, and, and coming at it from a, friend, uh, a frame of like conversation and uh, maybe, I don't know, like just 
harsh judgment on the other people, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And hopefully that's all done in like, in, and even talking through that stuff, like, man, there's so much grace in it. Cause it, because the reality is every time I come to the scripture, I mean, I have my worldview. I only know my life. <laughs> I, so I only know the places in which I've grown up. I only know the people I've been around. I only know, like, I don't know yeah. the entire view on things. So what are the tools that are helpful along the way to expand that? Well, when you read scripture, like, Imagine three different people reading it. Imagine a, a teenage girl without family around her who's pregnant, and she reads that passage. What's it mean for her? What's that look like? What's it look like for the the person that's you know on their second felony charge and whatever? And you go, and it's like, what's this passage mean for them? What's this mean for? You just kind of keep going down the list, and like, there's ways in which we're trying to understand. And broaden ourselves, but again, that's uncomfortable. Yeah, it's, you, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Th those are you know instances of hard conversations. I think even harder ones are uh, ones that don't even align with like the 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 talk of or your your, your religion that you have chosen faith in. Right, mm -hmm. different faiths having conversation are mm -hmm. a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those are those are two di different lenses, you know. There's right. the top religions of the world. Those are like lenses in which I think, you know, they believe. So mm -hmm. that's that's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And 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 oh, this could go back to some over functioning, under functioning stuff. How much are these conversations hard? Because I need everyone else to agree with me, hmm. and therefore. I need to change everybody when they speak. Therefore, I don't listen anymore. I just try to give answers to them so that they get they get to see it my way. That would all be over functioning in that I can't just sit in a non-anxious space and be present to someone else who disagrees with me. And I need to over function in their life to get them to move this way. Like Jesus didn't even do that. Yeah. And he could have, he could have spent his time trying to just like shaking people. Like, do you not get it yet? Like, and he didn't. And, and over and over again, he's able to like sit in tension with people that were so different than him, sit at the table with people that were so different with him, engage conversation with people that were so different and not in some forceful, weird way where he's trying to like manipulate people towards the way he saw things. He's inviting people constantly. So how much more is it just us, even in different religions, like, you know, sit and talk and like, man, that's so fascinating. You guys see Jesus that way. What's that mean? Hmm. You know, or so when this, when this happened in the scriptures, does that have any impact on you? Like that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely found, I found myself there at like some points, like just family stuff, like mm -hmm. thinking I have the right answers and I know like exactly what to totally. do for the next step. And it's like, yeah. <sighs> Thinking back at who that was, like what was coming out and what would I, what I was saying, it's just like, how did you get there? Yeah. Like, well, how would you, how did, yeah. what was developing, like to develop that kind of mentality or mindset? Yeah. So, hey, yeah. Um, at what point, and this is maybe an open ended question, but at what point do you think that there needs to be some answers for things? Ooh. Oh, this is a good one. Because I was going to run off something yeah. like that, too. Because, I mean, hmm. you know, we can sit and, and talk all yeah. day, you know. Yeah. But. What do you think? Hmm. I think it becomes a, to a point where there needs to be essentially like a, a, a truth, right? Um, that's been something I've been actually thinking about mm -hmm. a lot lately. Like there, there needs to be a truth, you know. Mm -hmm. And even on our last uh Episode, what was it, the Zarathustra? Last week, you know. Oh, our uh, actual episode. No, well, uh huh, yeah. Two two episodes ago, um, there was the idea of like you know like big thing, big like super deep like morality. You know what I mean? Is it true? Is it is there is there multiple truths? Is is what is good? What is evil? Right? And I think um, it takes more conversation to at least get there. I, I personally believe that you know there there has to be a God. I believe, I believe in God. So there, there is an essential truth to things, mm -hmm. but I think when it comes to those conversations, you know, when do we shift the, uh, there has to be a common lens in which we can agree on some things. Mm -hmm. Right. So there mm -hmm. is some truths mm -hmm. there. Yeah. 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 With you, Deb? I was gonna, cause I'm sort of like looking through the lens of like where you stand, mm -hmm. like say for the church, like at some point, you're going to reach a level of 
pastor, which you're, you're there. Mm-hmm. And so people come to you for answers, and mm-hmm. like which you understand. Like you might not have the right answer, but you have something that you might want to listen to. Yeah. So my mind goes to like not so much seeking like so like sort of the David's topic because I agree with what David's mm-hmm. saying. But my <laughs> my initial thought went to like leadership. Like mm-hmm. someone at, at the end of the day has to take charge. Yeah. Someone has to provide an answer because everybody's just gonna run yeah. around with their head chopped off unless someone like puts the sword down and says, Everybody listen. Yeah. Let's do this. If it doesn't work, let's do this. Yeah. Okay, and now at least we have a plan. Yeah. It's not to say it's the right plan, but yeah. it's it's set in stone and we're gonna move forward in this direction. Yeah. And so that's how I took it. Um, and I don't know if there's like a, it is probably like an open-ended question on like yeah. truth. I mean, it just like what, what came to mind. Yeah. yeah, yeah at yeah. what point? Yeah. Well, like, like, so like, yeah, so I'm leading a church and every time someone comes to me, I just say, I don't know. Hmm. Like at some point you're like, do you know anything? Like you're not actually helpful. You actually seem <laughs> like you're illiterate and you know nothing. Why are you leading anything? Right. So like, yeah, you can't just say, I don't know all the time. Um, there's always that conversation of, uh, or at least in the Christian world, this idea of like grace and truth. Mm-hmm. And so what that oftentimes is saying is that you need to speak truth, but oftentimes truth hurts. So you need to find a way to do it in a graceful way. Mm-hmm. And those need to be held in tension. If we actually think about what truth is throughout the scriptures, truth is, is and, and knowledge is, is actually like intimacy with God. It's not more information or facts. It's, it's actually a deep knowing that's connected with a relational being. Um, we have knowledge of each other. And like here sharing this space, uh, we could sit here and, con- and continue to learn more about each other and more facts about our stories. Would we know more about each other? Maybe. We could have more information, but is there also a reality in which I could know so much more about you, yet uh, the depth of intimacy that we could have as friends in a, in a relationship, that can be met whether we have more information about each other or not. Shared mm. experience, you know, those kind of things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. like, there's an aspect in there that says, so where does truth reside in then? And, and is, it, is it in answers of things? Yeah, of course. Answers are super helpful. I would love to, when I ask your name, I would love for you to say your name back to me. That's really helpful <laughs> in us like having information about each other. Um, the grace aspect is, I think, like not only just, hey, do I say this kindly? It's that may everything be soaked in grace, meaning that even when I offer something, there's grace in whether that was right or not. Mm-hmm. Um, whether I offer something to you and you take it or try it on or not, I'm offering grace and that you may or may not try it on. And I, that's not that you don't find value in my answer or my thought, but that's just where it's met. And mm-hmm. so there is an idea that, yeah, a leader needs to lead. If you're not leading, then you're not a leader. Um, and a part of that is making decisions on not only just behalf, behalf of yourself, but oftentimes for a group or a system of something. Um, and then, yeah, I think there's also like just knowledge of like, even what I think about as being a pastor, like, yeah, some scriptural knowledge is really helpful. Do I have to know everything? No. But like, are there some basic things that are really helpful in guiding people towards Jesus and in life with God? Absolutely. Um, now, the ways in which I offer those or apply those, that really matters. Yeah. Um, so, yes. And I don't I don't even know if I even gave a specific example on that. But yes, like answers are very helpful. Now, yeah. the other reality is at what point are answers unhelpful? Mm-hmm. And so then mm-hmm. do you give answers even when they're unhelpful? Or do you let there be mystery or tension? Or maybe it needs to be resolved through trying some stuff on rather than just handing the answer over. Um, So I I think Mm. there's also a helpful, unhelpful gauge um, that that could help in determining. Could you 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 interchange uh, answers with truth? Like, is it possible to... Yeah, what was that? Say more. So like how we're using... And I'm running off of like how David was explaining, like yep. he believes there is an underlying truth. There is a, there is a meaning to our existence that maybe we can't fully see, but there's an underlying truth, whether it's our physical existence or it's like the, un, the unnatural that we can't see the energy, mm-hmm. whatever, or if it's just our everyday lives, there's truth mm-hmm. to everything we do. There's mm-hmm. certain truths and there's certain false, just like how you said, depending on the answer you give, some mm-hmm. answers can be like, they, you might not know the answer and you're still trying to provide it in grace, yeah. but you also can provide an answer that can be hurtful or un- unhelpful. Yeah. 
So thinking about if it's interchangeable, if an answer is interchangeable, well, let's say it was truth, like mm-hmm. we're using answer instead of saying truth. Is that a way to replace like that word answer with truth? Like, but just saying like mm-hmm. there is an underlying like thing that we have to foundationally understand, like principle, life, meaning, morals, ethics, faith, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it's business. Like there's things that we abide by yeah. uh, in every aspect of life. Yeah. Um, and so like like. I, is it are those interchangeable or is that like because me and me and david always we yeah. have this conversation so much about like truth and what is truth because there has at least i believe there has to be good and evil yeah. like not everybody's not neutral yeah people lean one way or another and we I would like to think that the most of the world knows what's good and evil, mm-hmm. even if you don't recognize it through like your own personal lens, like yeah. saying like how I act today. And if I go see somebody and I don't treat them with grace or respect, yeah. doesn't mean I'm evil because I've never operated that before, operated that, uh, operated that way before. So I don't see it as evil, yeah. uh, a evil way of treating people. But someone that has grew up in like family oriented, parents, mannerisms, things that have been applied, they know they could see like how they're operating, how it could affect people negatively. Mm-hmm. And they see that it's like a negative evil. Yep. So the underlying truth just meaning there is a way that we can see all of these things if it's morals, ethics. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I yeah. know that was kind of like a lengthy. You no, know, I don't know. This is, this is the thought that comes up. Like, I don't know. I bring my car to a mechanic mm-hmm. and they're going to give me an answer on what's broken or what's working. But is there like an underlining knowledge or truth of how the car operates? Mm-hmm. Like in that, like, no, but it's helpful to have that answer of, hey, well, this is actually the spark plug and, hey, here's the carburetor over here. And this is why this isn't working. And now there's something, though, that's like underneath all of that or upholding all of that. Where just because I have the answer to the spark plug doesn't mean I actually it's making have the, the truth. Run, yeah. The, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the car run. I don't understand the full picture. So we could change the answer or the knowledge about something. Or there could be different answers or knowledge to the same thing uh, in which could be applied, yet there could still be the same like undergirding of truth or the reality of something that that's going to remain either way, whether you choose this answer or not, Mm -hmm. or whether you're going to have this little bit of information or not. Um, And so hopefully, and again, I think maybe this is part of something that Jesus is up to is like he seemed to always be drawing from and towards the same truth hmm. throughout his entire existence. Now, the ways in which we saw, we, we saw that applied and the questions that were drawn out and the, the ways in which he told story and parables, they were always different. The, you know, there's obviously things were weaving in and out and there's some similarities in the gospels, but he's pointing to the same truth hmm. over and over and over again. Um, and how you arrive to that truth, it can come through many ways yeah, of, I mean, it's you know it's the idea that well he is the way but it's like man like i actually experienced jesus first when i was forgiven by this person man i i really experienced jesus when i saw that person serve that other person yeah i experienced Jesus like those are all different ways of getting to the same truth um and so are we are we open to different experiences and different questions and trying on different things yeah yeah that's really good um, well, I think that's, I was about time. We do have th- like, we have an end segment. I don't know if you have yeah. that written down, Ooh, um, but it. it's almost like rapid fire. Rapid fire. Here yeah. we go. Yeah. Three questions. Well, David real quick, before we get to that, um, uh, I have a last question I want to ask, yeah. and this is maybe for our listeners out there who maybe watched and they are open to having the discussion of, um, maybe just in general about God, uh, Mm -hmm. the story of Jesus, um, Mm -hmm. when trying to open up to God, where should someone start? Hmm. Poof. I think right there, honestly, um, the recognition and everyone does it differently. This might be a thought in your head. This might be an act of something. This might be a short prayer. Um, but actually starting with some form of like, all right, God. So like, if you're real, if this is the way my life is, or I don't understand all these things, like, help me see. Like, I, I actually want to open myself up to you or to this or be open, whatever it is. 
I think that in and of itself, not only takes a great amount of courage, but it's also like a step of vulnerability to say I'm offering myself with my past experiences, with my past hurts, with the things I still am angry about and I don't understand, at the same time, two things can be true. I can have all those experiences and yet still open myself up to something outside of myself. That's a vulnerable thing to do, even to get to that point. From there, I th like th I believe in the idea that God's spirit is the one that does the work inside of us to actually comfort us, to convict us, to um, open us to the things that God is doing in and around our lives. And you, like things just start to kind of happen. Now, for mm -hmm. some, they might be at a point where like, all right, I'm going to go check out a church on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Great. Man, hey, I'm going to call my friend that's been talking to me about Jesus for quite a while. <laughs> Great. Or that's the person of why they don't want to go to church. Um, or, uh, yeah, wh whatever it is, there could be st like practical steps after that. But I think that first point of just like, yeah, I'm here, I'm open mm. and then go from there. We do, um, we've talked a little bit about it. There's a, it's a program and I don't think the answers are always in programs. Um, but we do something called alpha and it's a space in which anywhere from eight to 12 weeks, uh, each session we eat together, we chat and actually have dialogue. We watch a short video and then we like everyone gets to freely talk about what their experience. So the, the video might be, who is Jesus? And then afterwards, we actually get around a table in a non-judgmental way, not to provide answers, but to create a space for people to be like, man, that was, that was different than what I thought Jesus was like. Cool. What, who'd you think Jesus was? And, and you talk about it. And this person sees it differently over here. And, and it's actually a space to talk about like the bigger questions around Jesus and the church um, in a non-judgmental way, non-ideological way. So even things like that, I think, are really helpful um, just to be open to and press into and have conversation around. Sweet. Yeah. So there's some thoughts. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for answering that one. I wanted to maybe some of the people listening to maybe if they had that on their mind or on their heart that they could start there. Yeah. Let's go. All right. So we got some lightning questions, just rapid fire questions. Uh, what are three of your favorite books? Ooh. Bible, number one. <laughs> yeah, it's in there. It's in there. Uh, I, I'll go. So, I'll, so to, to not, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one out for now. Mm -hmm. um, so a fiction one I just read recently that was wonderful that I got from Ish Mendoza uh, was Paulo Coelho. Um, he, he's got a number of good books, uh, but it was called The Spy. Um, so that's in there. Um, uh, one of the ones I go back to over and over again is called The Patient Ferment. Um, uh, it's about the, the early church and what actually is a historian, a sociologist actually goes back and writes this book and about the early mm. church. Okay. Um, and then a third one, um, any one of Dallas Willard's uh, series of books on spirituality. Um, okay. Dallas Willard was a, he was a philosopher at USC and then he was also a theologian. Um, and he writes uh, from hearing God, uh, hearing God is actually probably one of my favorite, but he has a number of books on helping understand just spirituality and it's amazing. Okay. So, Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what advice would you give to your younger self? <laughs> uh, um, it's okay to be yourself. Hmm. Powerful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me about a time or someone who has impacted your life. Oh, a lot. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think so much of my story is formed by my parents. Uh, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the, and this will be very quickly because it's rapid fire. Um, but <laughs> one of the things I think about, even my return to to church and faith after partying for a number of years in college and just you know doing my own thing, um, when I when I when I got to a point one night of um, of chaos or of, of deep need of somebody, uh, my first call was my parents because I know that I could always call them no matter what. So whether I was far off or close or they're in agreement with what I'm up to or not, they were always there. And one of the things that I think is an imagery of that is playing soccer. I was a goalkeeper and every half you switch sides. And, uh, I always remember whatever half I was on was the same side that my dad would stand on. So he would move <laughs> sides of the field. And so that that was something that over time, my parents have just always been present. They've always been grace filled. They've, they've always told me when I was really messing up and like, <laughs> here's some yeah. truth for you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, but like, and we of course had our disagreements. And at the end of the day though, they were always there no matter what. So that's been forming in so many ways. 
Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, really thank you so much. Fun. Fun. Yeah, this yeah, is really chat. fun. This is really good. Is good stuff. Right. We're all wrapped that's up. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. It is. Done. That's fun. Yeah, that was a really fun conversation. 